Welcome back to the Be A Man podcast where we encourage men to be better men. Let's get into it. All right. Welcome to the podcast, Gary. I appreciate you coming on tonight. Why don't you introduce yourself for those who don't know who you are? Ah, okay. So I'm Gary Varvel. I'm a a national award-winning syndicated editorial cartoonist. How about that? So I've been doing this for a long time, been in journalism for 40 years and uh, was with the Indianapolis Star most recently left in 2019. And I've been on my own since then, have a uh, website, GaryVarvel.com. You can go there and you can see all the stuff that I'm doing. You can um, sign up for my newsletter. I'll send my cartoons to you. I also write about uh, current events from a biblical perspective. I have a book out called Drawing the Right Way. It's not an instructional book on how to draw. It's uh, people who think the right way, conservative way. That's what I'm drawing about. So that's a little background. And um, I'm married to my lovely wife, Carol. We have three children, three adult children. We have eight grandchildren. And uh, I'll leave it to you to ask any other questions. That's a little bit of an intro. Yeah, so I... I grew up on the south side of Indianapolis, so I'm well aware, lived yeah. in Mooresville is where I grew up and then lived in Carmel for a little bit. And mm-hmm. now we're in Illinois, but uh, long little, you know, I'm a, uh, a pastor of a small rural church out here, uh, okay. kind of near Champaign, Illinois. So yeah, I know uh, where Champaign is. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's, yeah, it's interesting, but uh we're um, I, I'm excited to have you on. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, I'm hoping we can get into, but um, tell me more about what you hope to accomplish. So you're a cartoonist. So what do you hope to accomplish with your work? Well, anytime you're in what uh, you're, if you're in the communication business and I was I spent most of my career in opinion journalism. And so the main goal of an opinion journalist, and in my case, an editorial cartoonist, is I'm trying to express opinions that I have about what is going on. And it was, um, I was always fascinated with the art. I met uh, and Jerry Barnett, an editorial cartoonist, when I was 17 years old. And when I saw what he did for a living, which was he would come to work, draw a cartoon and go home, I thought, that's the job for me. <laughs> Where do you sign up for that? And so um, I was fortunate enough that that was in the plan of God for me to do that. And so I got to actually become the editorial cartoonist in my hometown. And basically, I was born in Indianapolis, and that's where I spent my my whole career. And so any time you're communicating, you're trying to you're trying to do three main things. Uh, You're trying to convey information. One, you're also trying to reach a person's heart. You know, that's their emotional Mm -hmm. feelings and try to get them to feel things. And then if you can accomplish both of those things, then maybe the goal is to uh, impact their will. So their intellect, emotion, and will, the three parts of you on the inside Mm -hmm. make up your soul. And that, um, if you can get people to respond, and sometimes, you know, people respond to me negatively. They don't like what I'm, what I have to say, but, uh, Nevertheless, that's what I think God's called me to do. When you look at the Old Testament, for instance, uh, the, Old, the Old Testament prophets weren't well received in their time. <laughs> and they right. uh, got a lot of pushback. But that doesn't mean they were wrong. They were right. And, mm-hmm. and the crowd was wrong. And I found that a lot, too, that the crowd is usually wrong. <laughs> um, and yeah. so that doesn't, that doesn't bother me. When I was young, that would bother me a lot. I, you know, I was a young guy, wanted everybody to like me, but... Mm. The career that God put me in, he uh, he had me grow a thick skin so that I can handle it, you know. And one of the main goals of being able to take criticism is I don't know who they are. They don't know me and I don't know them. So I don't care what they have to say, mm. you know, uh, and I can discount it. And you have to be able to, to know how to take criticism. And if it's not valid, you know, if... Uh, I always tell the story, the true story about, I got an email from a guy from Chicago. He saw my cartoon and thought he needed to put me in my place, I guess. So he writes me and says, you know, uh, obviously you don't know what you're doing. Your cartoon today was terrible. And I feel I'm embarrassed for you. Mm. And so 
I wrote him back and I said, obviously you're not paying close attention. Mm -hmm. I've drawn a lot worse than this. <laughs> and then yeah. he wrote back and said, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can poke fun at yourself, I think that, uh, that goes a long way. And, in, in you know, instead of picking fights, if you could, it's hard to beat up a guy who makes fun of himself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So one of my, one of my goals in kind of doing this is just <clears throat> encouraging men to be better men. Yeah. So I, I, I'm hoping that one of those areas is criticism. And yeah. I mean, I know you're not, you receive plenty for what yeah. you do. And, uh, especially lately i i get the the news the emails and different things i'm like yeah. that is straight truth and i can't imagine the the comments he must get from this one but uh i i just wonder it what are some you I mean laughing at yourself but what are some tips for guys who chris criticism is going to come to every man who's trying to make a difference sure yeah so wh what are some tips you would suggest well, I'm not saying that I don't have an ego. I do. And so it can, it <laughs> yeah. can get bruised and it obviously does, but it, it hurts more if it's coming from somebody who I know, you know, mm -hmm. if it's coming from a family member, then that stings. Yeah. Um, or, you know, I understand if you're working for an employer and you get criticized, that stings as well because they are controlling your paycheck and, you know, yes. you want to keep the job. And so you kind of go along to get along. I get all of that. I was there. Uh, I really like being on my own now, so I don't have a boss. And so people can criticize and I, it doesn't affect me at all. You know, it doesn't change <laughs> one, one bit of thing. And the other thing too, so I found a lot of times, especially online, I think people will like to get into fights online. Silly. To me, that's completely mm -hmm. silly. Um, obviously they're dug in. I'm not going to change their mind. They're not going to change my mind. So why are we talking about it? There were times when in the new Testament, you'll see that Jesus, um, he didn't respond to people sometimes. Herod said, do a miracle. Come on. I want to see something. I heard about you. Let's see it. He didn't even, he didn't say one word to him. Mm. But yet when he went and before Pontius Pilate and Pilate would ask him questions, he answered him. Mm -hmm. So you have to, I think you have to have some discernment about it. how is it going to be received? If what I have to say, if they're asking me something and if what I have to say, if they're going to receive it, well, then I'll talk with them. But if I get the idea that there's some, you know, they're just trying to, to make, either trying to make me look bad or trying to pick a fight, you know, they got, I'm not going to give them the time of day because mm. I'm actually rewarding them for bad behavior. I'm not going to do that. I mean, in the case of the guy who wrote me from Chicago, you know, he didn't curse at me. He was trying to shame me a little bit. Obviously, mm. the cartoon, I, he, I, he didn't like what I drew. And so I just poked fun at myself and it all went away. You know, I had a guy years ago, back before the internet, <laughs> I was <laughs> doing this back before the internet and I, people back then would call you on the phone mm. and I would feel these phone calls and people were so mad. And, uh, I remember one guy called me and he was upset about something. I can't remember what I, what I drew. And so I just let him talk. And in the conversation, he said something about him being a military guy. So as soon as he took a breath, I asked him, I said, where did you serve? And then I started asking him questions about, and then I thanked him for his service. I mean, he did something, he did a hard thing and he did something that I benefited from. And by the time we got off the phone, we were friends. Hmm. I think he'd forgotten all about what I drew that he didn't like. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, I try to try to love people. Some people are hard to love though. Right, Justin? I mean, yes. that's just, they just are. Yes. But being a man, uh, as in the kind of man that Jesus, you know, portrayed when he was on the earth, uh, described as meek. Mm -hmm. Now, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. Mm -hmm. And obviously he could have snuffed out anybody who crossed him, but he didn't do that. He felt compassion for people. And the other thing too, is I, I understand a lot of times where people are coming from. I think it helps when you understand where they're coming from. And so asking questions is a good thing. Jesus did that. And actually he didn't need the, need the answers. He wanted them to verbalize what they were saying. I think back to, um, this is years ago, early 2000s, I think it was, I was at a cartoonist convention 
And a group of us guys uh, went and played some basketball, pick up hoops on the out, outdoor court. I was much younger then. And when we got done, um, I was teamed up with a guy uh, from the Sacramento Bee. And uh, Rex Babin was his name. And we had great time playing basketball. I think he liked because I, I passed to him a lot. And he, he was a good shooter. We got done. We were sitting and cooling off, drinking some water, talking. And he said, okay, Gary, let's cut through the bull. He says, you know, you're a nice guy. We come out here, play basketball. We had a good time. We have good conversations. How can you be conservative? Hmm. And I said, well, you know, I grew up in Indiana, central Indiana, and my parents, uh, you know, were married, loved one another, took care of my brother and I, took us to church. I mean, this is Midwest mm -hmm. values. This is kind of what I grew up with. I said, what about you? I said, tell me about your home life. What, what was your childhood like? Well, his was completely different. His mm -hmm. was, I think his dad died when he was young. Mother was on welfare. Uh, as soon as he was old enough, he got a job. And, you know, they were just, you know, hand to mouth. They, they were having a hard time. So he mm -hmm. sees the big value and big government taking care of people, whereas I see big government just wants to control our lives. And so it's we're coming from a, mm -hmm. we have different worldviews. We're seeing the world completely differently. He was not a believer. I am a believer. So we, we there was a lot of things that were different. I understand where he's coming from. I don't agree with it because what he needs is Christ. Um, mm -hmm. But, but you know, I I am the way I am because of my upbringing. But also, Jesus made the difference in my life. Mm -hmm. And I see, I, I even uh, even conservatives are not all Christians. I mean, I I know a lot of conservative yeah. cartoonists who are not believers, but. Um, through a course of events in their in their youth, I guess they've discovered that conservatism is the better way to go. So yes. that's a long answer, but I think that yeah. you know, I mean, things trying to trying to love one another, trying to love people, but at the same time um, understand that where people are coming from, and you don't dance with the devil. <laughs> you just, I mean, the Bible tells us. I mean, Paul tells us in Second Timothy chapter three that uh, he describes what people will be like in the last days. He says there'll be perilous times and people will be like lovers of money, lovers of self, lovers. And then he talks about them being unloving to people, unforgiving. And he talks about them being brutal and crude. And and then he says this, have nothing to do with them. Mm. Oh, so I thought we were supposed to you know, evangelize everybody and engage mm. them. There are some people who are not in a place that yeah. they will accept it. And so Jesus didn't talk to some people. And um, so I kind of take a page out of that. If I think the Lord's leading me to, then I will do it. But it, it yeah. doesn't make you have to engage everybody. You just, some people who are, um, I discovered this, Justin, some people who are, uh, are high maintenance <laughs> will eat your time away. Yeah. With no, there, there's, you're never going to move them closer to Christ. So, Mm. Why are you doing that? Yeah. So it, at, at some point, the Lord has to deal with that and deal with them. Somebody yeah. comes up to me and asks me, you know, why are you the way you are? Or, well, now I'm going to tell them, right? Yeah. But if yeah. they come up and, and chastise me because I'm pro-life or I'm, you know, this, you know, I don't, I don't know what to say to you really because, <laughs> because you don't want to receive it. You don't want to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. I hear, I, yes, I see exactly what you're saying. I, uh, I mean, once that door's been opened, I mean, you know, all bets are off. I, I'm going to take full advantage, but you're sure. right. There are some people who just, they don't want to, they don't want to hear it. And their eyes have not been opened to the beauties of the gospel yet. And no, what they need, but they don't know they need, mm -hmm. I, I think. And it, so, it's interesting. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, the, the parable of the four soils. Oh, yeah. That is, that is a picture of people's hearts. And some people are, they, they got the rocky heart, you know, or they got the, 
the hard heart that uh, the, the seed won't even get into it or if it gets into like rocky soil it, it starts to grow but then it doesn't have any root system to take over and can't can't produce or uh, or it falls on hard ground and then the devil comes and steals the seed away mm -hmm. but then there's the good ground right so uh i think about that um when I'm talking to somebody, if I see a witness, witnessing opportunity, and I like to try to start off with like my own personal testimony, but also talk to them uh, about themselves. I, th I love the Ray Comfort method of, of speaking to mm -hmm. people, you know, use the law. It's what mm -hmm. Jesus did. What's the law say? Uh, but I met a guy this week and, um, and I won't say his name, but he um, uh, retired military, disabled. Um, young guy but i asked him something you know he was asking me some questions and i asked him i said do you go to church no i said oh do you believe in god no i said do you got a few minutes so you can sit and talk and so we sat and talked for about an hour and uh you know coming from a place of uh, i want first of all i wanted to kind of figure out do you you just believe there's no God or are you not sure there might be a God but you don't know and he admitted that he's an agnostic he, he's not sure but he doesn't think so but and then what would you do in that situation I he was he had one of my cartoons with him and I said what if I told you that cartoon was not drawn by anybody it just the ink magically appeared on mm -hmm. paper which just kind of formed out of nothing and it just made these images and you would think I was nuts right <laughs> And I said, and yet we can look at God's creation and say, well, that just happened by itself. That mm. I, I said, that takes more faith than I've got. I don't have that much faith. Mm. To me, I believe in one miracle. God always, always existed mm -hmm. and everything else is explained. He, he, is, he is a creator, God who creates out of nothing. And he made everything that there is and made all the rules and laws that, that bind it together. Uh, that's easier for me to understand that. So we had quite a talk and, um, but you know, I find, I ask him questions about his upbringing and his life experiences and they're much different than mine. See? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I understand that he's rocky soil. Now that doesn't mean he'll always be that way. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping that maybe some, something from my conversation and maybe we'll have more conversations that will start tilling up the soil of that heart and getting it yes. to be fertile. Yes. Yes. That would be awesome. I, I think it's challenging now, uh, and I'm learning this more and more. We're living in a time where at one time people generally had a knowledge of scripture, generally yeah. had a knowledge of Jesus. And now right. you'll meet people who they've never heard about Jesus. Right. And right. Um, it, it's becoming more and more common. It, and even if they have, it's not it's not the same. He was just a good teacher. He was just something like that. And you're starting to see this cultural war, if you will, that mm -hmm. has been taking place for quite a while, but it, it's causing, I guess, challenges I, I, and I, opportunities too, for you to have these kind of conversations, but it's going to require that relationships to be built. I think even more, would you agree? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, yeah, it, it depends. Every, everybody, every situation is different. If you're going to have, you know, there are situations where your, your lives have connected and now you're going to have a relationship. You're going to be with this person on and on for a while. Okay. So that's, yeah. that's a time to, to build. But sometimes, you know, like the, me and this guy recently, I mean, we, we just, we, we intersected and then we go our different ways. And mm -hmm. if, if the Lord brings us back together, that's fine. If not, you know, the results are up to him, not me. It, it doesn't depend on me winning him. Uh, we're just called to be witnesses, and we just tell what we know. And then mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit's the is the prosecuting attorney that has to make the case, right? I try to do yeah. the best I can with what knowledge I have and my own life experience. But yeah, I I think that you're right. We have a culture today that is biblically illiterate, mm. and they have bought in to the lies of the devil that the bible is just a storybook that it's changed over years and years um 
And so we have to understand as Christians, we have to understand these are what other people, these are the lies other people have been been told and they bought it. And so how do you combat that? Hmm. And so that came up in my conversation, you know, and one of the things I, I said to the guy, have you, ever, have you ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah. I said, okay, I'll give you, for instance, and you can look it up. I'm not making this up. One of the things they found was the complete text of the book of Isaiah. In fact, in a museum in Jerusalem, they have the whole text on this big cylinder in the middle, all the way wrapped around the cylinder. Mm. And I don't know Hebrew. The people who do know Hebrew say that the text of that has not changed from the Bible that we have today. Mm. Now, we have the, I would, it's not hard for me to believe that the God who created the universe can, can make sure that his word does not change. People will attempt to. And today we have all kinds of translations, and I understand that there, there can be some confusion. But when you go back to the original text and reliable translations, uh, the meaning is completely the same. And so, you know, you, you combat the lie with the truth. That's what you have yeah. to do. And yeah. it, but you have to know as, as believers, we don't, I don't think we think enough about this kind of stuff. And so I, you know, I gave him, he thought he had an argument. I knocked it down. Now, this didn't turn into an argument, but uh, you have to be able to know how to answer some things. And I'm not saying that I have every answer for every situation. But, and then the other thing I've discovered over the years is that people will try to take you down a rabbit trail. Yeah. And they'll get you off topic. And uh, what you have to do in that situation is say, well, that's an interesting thing that you said there. And I'd like to come back to that. But can we address this right now and go back to and we'll just keep trying to bring it back to Jesus? Mm -hmm. Who is Jesus? Well, why did Jesus? And the Bible says that, God, that Jesus is the creator in Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 17. And he made everything for himself. That means he made us for himself. I used the illustration of a family yesterday that... Um, you know, uh, my wife and I wanted to create a family. We wanted children. Mm -hmm. And why did we do that? We wanted children so that we could love them. And then hopefully in turn, they would love us. Mm -hmm. And God created people, but he wants us to love him. That's the first commandment. Love the Lord your God. But he doesn't force us to do it. Mm -hmm. And the reason I believe that he doesn't force us is if, it, if he forced us, then it's not love anymore. Hmm. It's love only if it's free. My, you know, I asked my wife to marry me. Now, she had a choice. She could have said no. <laughs> but if she hadn't, let's say we lived in a culture where she didn't have a choice. I just chose her and she had to go. Well, then I never know if she loved me or not. Right? Uh, hmm. It has to be reciprocal. It has to be free. And I think God gave us a free will to make a choice. And that love can grow over time. Uh, but a lot of people, as we know very well from Scripture, a lot of people choose no. They love themselves, so they love the world more, and they they get deceived, and they go another direction. You know, you mentioned something about our culture uh, not being biblical or Christian, and you're absolutely right. And so this is one of the things I write about. In fact, I'm doing a series now, right now in, in my uh, newsletter. If you go to GaryVarvel.com, you can sign up for free. But I'm doing a, a series on culture wars and um, what I'm writing about for Friday is, is how, uh, how what happened to the Christian culture. Hmm. And there are definite things you can go back and look at. Last year, I wrote about uh, seven men who ruled the world from the grave. It was based on a book by Dave Brees, and he wrote the book in 1990. He passed away in the early 2000, like 2003. But... I updated it basically because even Dave Brees would not have believed where we had come from that point. But these eight, these seven guys that he wrote about all were born in the 1800s. And the reason they were, ruled the world from the grave is their philosophies live on after they are already dead. Darwin, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, uh, Julius Wellhausen, uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes, Soren Kierkegaard, and John Dewey, these seven guys, and they had these philosophies that later on got picked up, became popular, especially in the 50s and the 60s in, in colleges. And then you have in 1962 and 63, prayer and the Bible were kicked out of, out of school by the Supreme Court. And 
10 years later, then we have Roe v. Wade. And then, uh, and then seven years later, we had the 10 commandments were kicked out of on public land. You could not post 10 commandments on public property. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do private. That's fine. But, and I think what happened is because we neglected the teaching of the Bible in schools, even if it's not by Christians, that's how you get a culture that's secular. And it was all designed to do that. I mean, that was the goal of Satan, uh, who is the God mm -hmm. of this world. He's the God of the air. And, and so that's what that you can see what's happened now. You had kids who, at least in former centuries, heard the Bible. You know, in school, my parents, when they were in school, the Bible was one of the textbooks. Mm -hmm. And they went through the stories and, and under, had a biblical understanding of it. Um, but then we had a culture now that's been totally secularized. And that's why you, you talk to the people and they don't know Jesus. You know, they've heard stories, but they don't believe he exists. They don't believe he actually existed. And so um, it, and so John Quincy Adams said there are three principles to morality. And I thought, this is genius. I don't know why no one's ever talked about this before but in our generation, but they need to. Those three principles, in order to have a moral people, three principles. One, God ex has always existed eternally. You have to understand that first, that there is a God and he exists eternally. Secondly, the immortality of the human soul. So that when we die, we continue to live somewhere. And then number three, that there's going to be a judgment for how we live here. There's coming a judgment day. And he said, you take any one of those three out and you will have a person that has a conscience no different than a tiger or a shark. Hmm. And I think we have a country and we have a world full of tigers and sharks today who act like animals because they don't believe there's a God. They don't believe they believe that when they when you die, you're just worm food. You just cease to exist. And they don't believe that there's ever going to be a judgment. And mm -hmm. without those three principles, then why obey any law? Why not just do whatever you want? Right. If yeah. you can get away with it because there's no consequences. Yeah. But if you really, truly believe that there has to be a God, this all just didn't happen. Number two, I have a sense that when I die, something continues on. Something happens after that, that I, this is, can't be all there is, just 60, 70, 80 years maybe, and that's it. And then thirdly, that there's coming a judgment day for based how I lived here and God's going to judge me. Well, all of it, that's sobering. And the Founding Fathers, you'll find so much of their writings, they, they talked about the importance of a uh, religious and moral people. And John Adams, the second president of the United States, said that we have a constitution for a religious and moral people. It's wholly inadequate for the government of any other. Mm. Because if you don't have people who can control themselves, then you've got anarchy. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you can't have a government big enough to control everybody. Yeah. So that's why, you know, I think that their understanding of the Bible was important. And for over, well, I'd say 150 years, it impacted the country, even though there weren't, let's say, in the 1900s, early 1900s, the majority of people probably in America were not Christian, but they had a cultural Christianity. Yes. You know, they had a culture of understanding it. You shouldn't lie, steal, cheat. Um uh, you should yeah. treat people, you know, the way you want them to treat you, that yeah. kind of principle. And that has gone. Yeah. 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 There was this morality, this understanding, there were things yeah. that were right and there were things that are wrong. And I think at, in a lot of what you're talking about is this postmodern culture that has yeah. impacted everyone around us. I was talking to a group of teens a homeschool group a few weeks ago on this an apologetics class and we were talking about postmodernism, and you know i was racking their brain because you know well that's your truth and that's my truth and you know and all the things you're hearing now and mm -hmm. it was driving them crazy and i was doing right. it on purpose so they could see how silly it is but i think that's part of what we are living now and part of what i talk about on here often is it seems as though we need men to step back up mm -hmm. and take the leadership and take right. the forefront again and a lot of what we're seeing is because we've seen a lack of 
godly, manly leaders. I agree. And, and I'm not sure when that shifted, uh, when that shifted in our in our country in particular, but it, it shifted at some point. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I mean, would you speak to that a little bit? Well, yeah, and, and it shifted in my lifetime. I could see it shift. Uh, so after you kicked the Bible out of schools, then you had the, yeah. the 60s generation of free love and free sex and everything, you know, there's nothing wrong. You just do whatever you want, multiple sex partners. And then you had AIDS and <laughs> yeah. sexual diseases. And, you know, so there are ramifications or consequences for living that lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Also, you had lives that are just, just destroyed. Uh, you can't carry on like that, like a bunch of animals and think that it doesn't affect your psyche, your soul is impacted and then people turn to drugs and alcohol and you had this spiraling out of control i i when i look and see that you know people uh like these flash mobs that go into stores and rob the store and all of that in the middle of the day and they know nobody's going to stop them that's what we are witnessing is generation after generation of really bad parenting yeah and it lies at the feet of men who abdicated their position in the home, who thought that they could have children without responsibility and leave it to the government to raise them, you know, fund the the single mom. Uh, We have a welfare system that actually uh, rewards uh, a woman who has children if there's no man in the home. Yep. And by they take care of it that way. And it sounds good socially on the outside but it plays out destroys the home which ends up and the home is the foundation of the country and once the home is starting to break up and we have lost the foundation it only makes sense that the rest of it's going to start crumbling the home is where we learn to respect authority that's a big problem that we have in society today we have people who don't respect authority you know they get pulled over by the police and then they get in a fight well, you know, I don't care even if the cop's wrong. You you obey the authority and then you handle it in court. Mm-hmm. But you don't just start fighting it out. And then and then also we have a society that blames always blames the wrong people. You know, <laughs> somebody br- makes a somebody commits a crime, and then we have to go figure out what caused him to do that. <laughs> he d- he did it, or or she did it. And so yeah. we're always trying to place blame somewhere else now. But I will say this, that uh, because men have not stepped up and been fathers, um, and they they have actually ruined their children. So now their children grow up and they become fathers, their sons become fathers, and they don't know how to be a father because their father was not a good father. Yeah. Now, I was fortunate in that my father was great. My dad was a great dad. And so... A, so much of the stuff I do as a dad and now as a grandpa is because he did it. I I saw, I had a first, first row seat to, you know, what a a dad is supposed to be like. And I hope my children have done the same thing. And it seems like they're on right on the right track. But what about a kid who has no father? You think about this guy who uh, just went up and shot up this gay bar out in Colorado. Yeah. And people wanted to blame conservatives for that and all that kind of stuff and tucker carlson but when you look at the guy's life his father Mm -hmm. left the home when he was young uh, became an mma fighter then turned to pornography and became a porn star and is addicted to drugs hasn't seen his son in forever is in fact when this happened he said i didn't know if he was still alive i hadn't heard Mm -hmm. from him for like you know six years or something like that yeah. And the, the mother also has problems. So this guy is a textbook situation for how a guy goes completely out of control. And, mm-hmm. and I, there's a, um, I can't think of the guy's name, but there was a guy who did study on these mass shooters in schools. All of them, broken home, bad relationship with their dad, which all of this could, so in the government, when they want to solve the, oh, we got to take the guns off the streets. We got to, we got to do this. We got to, we need more laws that, laws won't stop people from breaking the law. I mean, there's a law against murder and they committed that. Obviously, yeah. you know, another law is not going to make a difference. What's the real problem? You got to go back to the very root of it and it's the home. 
Mm-hmm. And the only way you can fix that is with Jesus Christ. But see, our government, because it wants to be secular, doesn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ, it wants to have that separated. Well, you get what you what you sow, right? You reap what yeah. you sow in that situation. So that's a, a long answer to uh, the importance yeah. of dads in the home. Moms uh, have a tremendous impact as well. That's why you need both of them. Yeah. But now we have people who don't know what a woman is. <laughs> yes. I tell you, Justin, I would, you know, just five years ago, I would have not, I would have never dreamed the insanity that's being talked about today. You know, just a few years ago, we would have thought, well, that's insane. And now you get chastised if you criticize it. Well, they're just going to have to criticize me because of what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to speak. Somebody's got to speak the truth. And you have a few people who are doing it awfully. Also, you know, Matt Walsh, he does it online. Uh, Tucker Carlson is not afraid of doing it. And the other thing people need to point I'm out. Sorry. Oh, my phone's talking to me. The other thing that people have to, uh, um, you know, Tucker Carlson talks a lot about this child mutilation. Yeah. Letting a child say, oh, I think I'm a different sex. And so now we want to do a transition and, and start cutting body parts off. That is a particular kind of evil that I can't imagine adults would actually go along with, but they are. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. You're seeing this wave of pedophilia being introduced yes. now. And there's a lot. Of, I will post something about that every once in a while when I, you know, little clips where I see it. Mm-hmm. And you, I mean, the comments I get, I they just, I mean, deride me and, you know, just throw stuff at me you're crazy you're a alex jones conspiracy theorist all this kind of stuff i'm like how are how how are you missing it (laughs) it's everywhere yeah because the god of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe that's why i recognize that you know when i'm in a conversation with like the guy this week he's blinded Mm -hmm. he doesn't know he's blinded but the god of this world has blinded him so that he can't see And the only thing that can break through is the gospel. Yeah. God loves you so much that he sent Jesus Christ to die for your sins. And, um, and, you know, Romans 1.16 says that I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. So Mm -hmm. the gospel itself, that message of Jesus Christ has the power to change people. That's the only thing that can do it. And so I try to share it um, and hope that they receive it. And a lot of times, you know, I think uh, it won't take right away. It's something that uh, the Lord can remind them of it later on. I talked with a guy years ago, about 1997, um, and he... um, he came to my office. He, he wanted to be a cartoonist or an artist or something. And so he, he didn't bring any work with him for me to see. And we talked a little bit. And then I, I said to him, um, can I show you uh, really the secret to knowing what your life was supposed to, what you're supposed to do, what's your purpose in life? And he said, yeah. And I said, you were created and you have to know your creator because he has a plan for you. Ephesians 2.10 says, you are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has prepared in advance for us to do. So, um, and I shared the bridge illustration, which is you take Romans 6.23 and then you just, you know, write it out Mm -hmm. and space it out. So I drew it out. So like there's a big gulf one side and the other. And then on one side, you write wages, sin, death. That's the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, and so the other side, you put gift, God, and eternal life. So the wages of sin is death on one side. That's what we get for being sinners. But on the other side, God wants to give us a gift, and the gift is eternal life. And it's through Jesus Christ. It's through knowing him. So I wrote this out to, for this guy, mm-hmm. drew it, and then I gave it to him. And I said, here, take this with you. And I said, and think about it. And I said, here's how you receive the gift. Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So it's a matter of believing and receiving by faith. God made a promise. 
and he's asking you to acknowledge that and so I tried to get him to understand it's a heart decision anyway uh i think it was three years later he contacted me and said i don't know if you remember me or not and he goes i came to your office and i said yeah i remember you he said well i wanted to thank you for what you did that day he said it didn't take right away but i kept that in my wallet and I would go back and look at it. And he said, it. I finally gave my life to Christ. And he said he was living in New York. And and I thought it was pretty cool. And I told him, I said, you know, that's, the Bible says that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. It's not me. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, yeah. you know, Christianity is just one beggar telling another beggar where to right. find bread. That's all it is, right? So I'm just telling yeah. him, this is what it is. And then the Lord used it in his life, you know. So, uh that's what we're supposed to be about. I, I would be my hope that more Christians, especially more men, would get bold about their faith, not be so af- ashamed. I mean, we have no problems talking about sports. Yeah, we could talk about hunting. You know, we talk about our hobbies. No problem talking about that. Well, why not talk about the thing that's most important in the world? And that's yes, is the our Creator, the one who created yeah. us. Yeah. Definitely. I, I think as we, we enter this Christmas season, there's, there tends to be a more openness to it by a lot of people. What would you suggest, or what are some suggestions to guys to kind of have those conversations, you know, to bridge those gaps a little bit, uh, to, to point, it's not just about the trees. It's not just about the lights. Mm -hmm. It's about the savior. Well, I think for one thing, if you haven't started some type of tradition, you should probably do that in your family, you know, uh, get them around, read the Bible, read the story of uh, the first Christmas, and you can do that. If you have grandchildren, then, you know, get do that with them. Uh, you can, um, you know, when our kids were growing up, we would do things that we weren't overly, I wasn't preaching with them all the time. We were just living life. But there were times when they would see my reactions to life experiences. Mm -hmm. And I would try to, at those particular times, bring it back to Jesus Christ. You know, God made us. And um, we would do devotions with them at night before they get into bed. And I would encourage every man to do that. You know, don't just leave that to your wife to do it. That should Mm -hmm. be, they need to see their dad doing it. the other thing too is i um i would read the bible at times when i knew my kids were going to be in the house not as an act i mean i like the bible anyway i love it anyway so i'd be reading it and they would see me reading it and then sometimes we would have talks about it we'd discuss things so it was just it's our lifestyle it's not something that we just do on sunday morning But the other thing I think, you know, if you're talking to other men or something like that, uh, here's one thing you could do. Tell them to go to GaryVarvel.com and uh, tell them to look at my like Christmas cards or something like that, because I've got a line of Christmas cards and or um, tell them to sign up for my newsletter, because I'm going to talk. Obviously, I'm going to talk about this through the month of December, talk about uh, what this is really all about. Sometimes you can find something that maybe you've been reading and then God will use it. I'll tell you one of the things I did, Justin, when I was young. A young parent, um, I prayed and asked God to change me. Mm. I, I was, uh, <clears throat> it's probably 1983, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, my, uh, my wife was expecting, was, you know, was carrying our daughter. And um, I remember um, having a prayer one morning, Lord, you got to change me. I can't change myself. Um, and I didn't like really the path that I was on. And I knew my kids were going to follow my footsteps. And so I, I needed help. And I asked God, and he changed me. One of the ways he changed me is I just made a habit of reading the Bible every day. Read it a chapter a day before you go to work. And if you read it in the morning, it's interesting that things throughout the day will bring that scripture back to mind. And so as things came back to mind, I found myself doing this. Not every day, but sometimes somebody would say something at work. And I'd say, you know, it's interesting you say that because I just read about this today in, in like Proverbs. And I would just share what a verse said. And uh, I, and then I would just move on. I didn't belabor it, didn't preach a sermon about it. I'd just say, oh, yeah, I just read about that today. 
Mm. And I think over time it impacted people and they started thinking me, you know, uh, somebody called me the Bible answer man one time because <laughs> <laughs> I would talk about the Bible. I had a guy in an interview one time ask me, he says, why do you talk about God so much? He said, you know, I'm Catholic. I go to church, but I don't talk about it all the time. I said, I find that I talk about the things I love the most. I talk mm -hmm. about my career. I talk about my wife, I talk about my kids. Why not talk about God? I mean, he's the only reason. He's the reason I'm here. I mean, I wouldn't even be here if he hadn't created me. So, but I think people, somewhere along the line, we have a culture that thinks that it's, you know, it's not proper to talk about the Bible in school, they think. Can't, teachers can't do it. And mm -hmm. so then they grow up with this culture thinking we're not supposed to talk about the Bible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because there, there's an old saying that you don't, uh, two things you don't talk about is politics and the Bible or, or God. And I end up doing both of those all the time. <laughs> so I just make people mad everywhere I go. But I think that, um, that the question would, would be, you know, if somebody asked me, why do you talk about it? Why don't you talk about it? Mm -hmm. It's, re it's real in my life. It's, it's, um, who I am. So then I, I do talk about it. <clears throat> And somebody who thinks that they're going to go to heaven, why don't you talk about it? Unless you're not going to heaven. <clears throat> One of the things I like about Ray Comfort is he uses that good person test. You think you're a per good person. Everybody says yes. And then he takes them through it. You ever told a lie? What's that make you a liar? Have you ever stolen anything, even if it's small? Yeah, what's that make you a thief? So you just admitted that you're a lying thief. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a blasphemer. And so on Judgment Day, uh, are you... Innocent or guilty? Guilty, okay, heaven or hell. And, um, and it, it impacts people. But that's what the law is supposed to do. It's supposed to uh, wake us up to the fact that we are in big trouble, but we have a problem. We don't think we're in, we have a problem, but we, we do have a problem. This guy I talked with this week, he said, well, Jesus died for everyone, so everyone's going to heaven. I said, mm -hmm. oh no, that's not what the Bible says. In fact, that's not what Jesus said. No. Jesus said, wide is the gate that leads to destruction and many go that way and narrow is the gate and, and narrow is the way that leads to life and few be there to find it. I said in Luke chapter 16, he talks about two guys who died and one guy goes to Hades, lifts up his eyes in fire and agony. Mm -hmm. So obviously not everyone is going there. And, uh, mm -hmm. He said, well, so who goes? And so then I was able to explain Romans 10, 9, 10, that mm -hmm. uh, it's a gift, but you got to admit that you're a sinner. And then you also have to admit that Jesus is Lord and that he raised from the dead and offers eternal life. And so um, yeah. these are things that if, you know, Justin, if we had men who would have that mindset, who would commit their lives to Christ and then live it out you know, get discipled and know how to be a disciple of Christ, follower of Christ, then this country could change. Mm. And it would be something that Cal Thomas said years ago, that you can't have a top-down morality. It has to be bottom-up. It has to bubble up from the masses. It can't. You can't just elect a Christian president and expect everybody to become Christian. That's not the way this works. It yeah. works from one life to the next, one person leading to an, leading another person to the Savior. It's Andrew going and getting his brother and saying, I have found the Messiah. Come here and see. You know, that's mm. that's what we need to do. If we had more of that, then we'd have the change. But uh, we have all kinds of problems, don't we, in the church? <laughs> I, I had a pastor years ago. He said, do you want to find the devil in the church? Look in the pulpit first. Because <laughs> that's where he <laughs> likes to target. So uh, you, sir, have a target on your back. Yeah. Um, and yeah, a lot of churches are all messed up, you know, doctrinally off base and conforming to the world and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. It seems like that has become more prevalent in the last three, four years than in generations before. And, and yeah. maybe it's just because I'm more aware of it, but it, it just seems like it is just the church is just succumbing more and more to yeah. the cultural pressures 
and not standing their ground. And it's rare that some, you find someone who is standing their ground. Yeah. And if they are, you probably won't hear about them because right, they're, right. they're nobodies, right? Uh, in the well, world's you know, eyes. I, I saw a tweet this past week and I'm going to, I'm writing about this. Um, Elon Musk, uh, he tweeted out, what do you think of the culture war? Mm. And the responses were fascinating, really great responses. One guy said that you, just as you can't win a, a naval war without any ships, you can't win a culture war without a culture. Mm. And the problem is that when we want to change the country, what we do is we, the people who have lots of money, give money to politicians who half of them lose, right? Yeah. And so that's wasted money when actually their money should be going to the culture. Politics follows culture, not the other way around. And so mm -hmm. if you were giving money to Christian filmmakers, for instance, Christian organizations that are doing things with media, reaching the culture with media, then you might have a shot. But right now we don't have much of that. We have a few. Uh, our son, Brett, is a Christian filmmaker and just uh, shot a movie in central Indiana called Disciples in the Moonlight. Now, you know, we need more people doing that kind of stuff. You know, it will take mm -hmm. it'll take several months to get this movie edited, soundtrack and everything, get it ready. And then you have to try to distribute it. And that's always a challenge because distributors don't like to pay much money to filmmakers they want to basically steal it and then they try to make money off of it and even they, they haven't done anything yeah um but the people who have who who've got is really blessed with money if they were to come alongside young you know talented people that god has gifted and try to impact the culture through the arts well now maybe you've got a, a chance to change some people's hearts and minds i mean that's what it's all about right it's we're trying to change people's hearts and minds we're trying to trying to get them to the point it goes back to what i said at the very beginning the intellect emotion and will mm -hmm. and i've had times that you know people have contacted me and saying you know your cartoon impacted me such a way that i that this is what i did and that's fantastic you know mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't always happen but that's my goal. I'm trying to make people think, and then and then the Lord will do with it what He wills. You know, after 9/11, I did a cartoon um, that depicted Uncle Sam carrying a firefighter, and and uh, mm -hmm. people flocked to buy that. Po we turned it into a poster at the Indianapolis Star, and we sold it to raise money for the relief effort in New York, and it, it raised one hundred thirty thousand dollars on that on that cartoon. Mm -hmm. So it impacted people intellectually, it reached their heart, broke their heart, and then they responded by doing something. And mm -hmm. that's when you know that you've hit one out of the park. Now, yeah. I've, I haven't always hit them out of the park, Justin, I've hit a lot of foul balls. <laughs> <laughs> and I've struck out a few times too. So that just happens, you know, they're not all winners, but you do the best you can. And, uh, and, you know, the other thing too, I like to say, uh, for anybody who's listening is that everybody's going to fail mm. but failure doesn't make you a failure quitting makes you a failure it's when you fail and then you just give up and quit and you don't ever try again you know you're going to fail as a father you're going to fail as a husband don't quit stay in it you know learn from it and do better and just and that's that's the thing i uh, there are many times in the past i've apologized to my kids I goofed up. I blew it. You know, I was too hard on them or whatever. And mm -hmm. uh, I think the apology probably had more of an impact than anything else. Uh, so don't be uh, ashamed to do that. Uh, don't be afraid of doing it. I think it. you have to, um, they need to, to see you being re real, you know, and I think that then it becomes real to them. I saw somebody, somebody tweeted this. I think maybe it was a meme. I think my wife showed me this. It was a meme saying that when you're a kid, you don't realize that your parents are kids as well. They've never been a parent before. They're learning, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so when you get older, then you look back and go, wow, I wish I had known then what I know now. You know, maybe things yeah. would have been a little different. Uh, but that's... That's just where we are. That's the way it's done. We learn 
as we move along. Yeah. I, you know, I, I realized we didn't talk much about my, my career as a cartoonist and that's really not the main thing for me. I can it's tell. What I, yeah. It's what I love doing. You know, I, I've been so blessed to have been able to make a living doing it, but um, that's not the main thing in my life. Mm -hmm. Main thing. What have I talked most about? <laughs> talked about yeah, the scripture. Lord. Be, Jesus, yeah, he, yeah, the Lord's uh, Lord's is the one, right? Yeah. And uh, that's trying to keep things in proper perspective. So mm -hmm. for men, I know you. We all have a tendency that our career becomes a big, big thing, becomes our identity, and uh, at some point, you're not going to have that career that ends. Mm -hmm. You know, but your relationship with Christ should go on and on. I think back to. Uh, you can stop me anytime from I'm talking. Oh, too you're much. good. Yeah, you're fine. So I, I love uh, it. I heard this some time ago, and I used it on a guy I met in. Uh, in fact, I met him in Champaign, Illinois. There was a convention oh. I went to there, some church. This guy was from Great Britain, hmm. and he, it was a um, online marketing kind of thing program using Amazon to make a business and money. And this guy said that he'd been doing it, had been very successful. He said, I really don't even know why I'm here. And then I asked him this question, what do you own that death can't take away? Hmm. He said, what? I said, what do you own that death can't take away? Think of it. Death takes away your home, your car, your family, your job, your relationships. He goes, well, what's the answer? I said, the Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you live for Christ, when you die, you get to be with him. You don't mm -hmm. lose, you win. <laughs> and uh, he said, wow, I've never thought of that before. And then he later emailed me when he got back to Great Britain. He said, I think you were the reason I was supposed to be there. Mm. Now, that was kind of a cool thing. Yeah. But here's, I had heard somebody else talking about that and it impacted me. And then I just shared it with somebody else. And that's kind of the way we should all be, right? You learn something, share it with somebody else. We're all teachers in a way. And when we learn something, share it with somebody else, get them to think, what is my priority in life? And hmm. if I my pri if my priority is something that death takes away, you got the wrong priority. Hmm. Yeah, we should be thinking. We don't think enough. Even Christians, Justin, don't think enough about where we're going to spend eternity. We mm -hmm. are focused on the horizontal instead of the vertical. Yeah. We have to think about the horizontal because this is where we live right now. But this yeah. is not our home, right? So yeah, that that's something that I've been thinking about more lately because over the last two years really you just saw a fear in Christians that didn't make a lot of sense if you really knew where your eternity lied right yeah and, you're and right. it's and it's I think more modern uh you know conundrum yeah. that we're we're facing that you know a hundred years ago they didn't think like that I, yeah. I, you don't read that anyways. And it just seems like, like, do, are you, do you not know that? Or like, is heaven just something that you kind of know about, but you don't really, are we not looking forward to it enough or are the church is not doing enough to make it? Hey, this is, this is your home. This is what we're, we're striving right. after to be with Jesus right. one day. Right. We have fallen too in love with the world. Yeah. And and that's the problem. We love the world more than we love God. And uh, what's first John two, fifteen to sixteen say, uh, do not love the world or anything in the world. Because mm -hmm. everything in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's mm -hmm. not from the Father, it's from the world. It's the enmity toward God. Uh it, it's uh so yeah, we we have to live here. And it's not that, you know, if you read Ecclesiastes, it's yeah, you should enjoy life. God gave you things here for your enjoyment as well. But if you start loving it more than you love him, loving the creation more than the creator, and then we go to Romans chapter one, and that's that's a sobering, you know, verses 18 through 32, where the people knew God, but they didn't worship him as God. They worshiped the creation instead of the creator. 
-hmm. So they suppress the truth. Then they replace God with their love of his creation. And then what does it say? It says three different things in these texts. It says, then God gave them over to shameful lust. Mm -hmm. And it gave them over to sinful lust. Then, and he doesn't say what those are. And no, they're sinful desires. I'm sorry. Then it gives them, he the sinful desires then he gives them over to their shameful lust and he describes shameful lust as homosexuality i mean go read it that's what it says mm -hmm. and then the last stage the last area he says then he gave them over to a depraved mind and a depraved mind he describes that and he gives a list of things and then he says this and then they invent new ways of sinning mm -hmm. that's where we are we have gone through every stage and we're in the final stage. So how did this even start? I look back to when the 63 decision by the Supreme Court, when they kicked the Bible out of school. Mm -hmm. And when they kicked the Bible out of school, it was the case was Abington versus Shrimp, uh, Shemp. And they kicked the Bible out of school. And so now you can't teach that there's a creator and they, that got replaced with evolution. Mm-hmm. Darwinism, Charles Darwin. So the, the guy from the 1800s, his philosophy now gets taught in the schools and it starts off as a theory. And then people start believing it as fact. Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly what Romans one says. They worship the creator, the creation more than the creator instead of the creator. And then, then you had the sexual revolution that came right on the heels of that. And then we have, well, today we have the cancel culture. I've been canceled many times. People try to, you know, try to cancel me. They don't like what I have to say. And, uh, that's where we are. That's, and that reminds me of uh, First Timothy chapter, you know, Second Timothy chapter two, chapter three, I should say. <laughs> Second Timothy mm -hmm. chapter three, about in the last days perilous times will come and it says that people will be unloving and unforgiving and that's the cancel culture they will not forgive you they will jump on you you apologize for hurting their feelings you don't get forgiveness they mm -hmm. want you to be unemployed they want you to not be able to make a living anymore i mean the, it's it's so, brutal yeah. yeah so there's no redemption it's a religion where there's no redemption. In Christianity, there's redemption. You know, we've all mm -hmm. failed. Christ paid for our failures, and then we've been forgiven, and we move on. And uh, uh, but that's not what that's not what the world does. No. And it's a sad it's sad to see it because I love this country. It's we are so blessed to have been born here. Mm hmm. But it's depressing for me to see that the how we have slid down the slippery slope and it's going faster and faster. And I can't even imagine what the next, you know, depra bit of depravity is going to yeah. come on us uh, because they invent new ways of, of yeah. sinning. And I mean, <clears throat> do you think do you think it can change or are we too far gone? Anything is possible with God. Nothing's impossible, right? I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but at the same time, as I understand scripture, um, and it says clearly that things will grow worse and worse before Jesus returns. So I tend to think more in the, in the line of that we're probably closer to Jesus returning than we are to a revival and we're going to have the new great awakening or something like that. I would hope that that would be it. It's difficult now because the media is so strong. You know, when you had the Great Awakening in the past, it was more one person to the next person. And then you had a, a cultural shift and the media didn't have as much impact. It was newspapers. You know, it took a while for the news to get transmitted around everywhere. Didn't have the power that had the media has today. There's so many avenues for people to get information, just like we're talking today. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, this podcast is probably not going to get seen by millions of people right <laughs> no. uh and so uh but there are media outlets that are preaching a lie that will mm -hmm. get millions of eyes on it and that will have an impact and so it's hard for the truth to get to get out and get spread and we have the avenues but trying to um people don't 
you know, also it says in scripture that uh, people will will attract themselves preachers who will tickle their ears. Yeah. They have itching ears. And so they want, they want to hear what they want to hear. They don't want to hear the truth. And it's uncomfortable for them to hear that you're a sinner and uh, you're headed for hell. <laughs> and Jesus loved you so much that he died in your place on a cross and then offers you eternal life. It's just, it, it, for some people, not all, but some people, that's just offensive to them. Mm -hmm. And the Bible said it would be. I mean, Jesus said very clearly, they're going to hate you because they hated me. And they'll persecute yeah. you because they persecuted me. And so it's not a mystery. He he already called it. This is going to happen. So I, I think that we're probably closer to the end. One of the significant things in, in that tells me we're close to the end is Israel. Hmm. You know, after nearly 2,000 years, then they become a nation again. They weren't a nation, and then they become a nation. You have uh, Jewish people flocking back there. They're speaking Hebrew again, which is actually an, a fulfillment of Scripture. So you have Ezekiel 36 and 37 being fulfilled, the valley of dead or dry bones coming back together. And and um, because they're there, tends to make me think that we're closer to the end, obviously. And then the things that are happening in the world, not just here. You look at what Jesus said nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. Certainly that has happened through all generations, but it's happening more in this day and age than I think in ever in the past. Yeah. I think I heard somebody say that the 20th century was the bloodiest century. More people died in the 20th century than ever before um, because of we have weapons of mass destruction and mm -hmm. And we had an onset of communism that killed hundreds of millions of people. Yeah. Which fascinates me that, that we have people in this country who would like to bring that here. Yeah. That's, an ins it that's just, insanity. <laughs> yeah. And I can, and, and truthfully, you, I can remember it being taught in school, mm -hmm. but not as something to be followed. But the thought was still there. Yeah. And looking back now, I can see it more clearly yeah. than I could then, obviously. But it, it's it's just, you know, I, I'm at the point. I, we have four kids. My oldest just turned 13. And mm -hmm. we uh, I'm at the point now where I'm I, I don't know if it can change. Yes, anything's possible with God. I'm also I love history and those types of things. Yeah. And you saw some of these things same things happening in roman history and i'm at the point where i'm going to teach them just to be faithful yeah, be faithful right, where right. you're at right now you know pursue jesus love him love your neighbor yeah and we'll leave the rest to god <laughs> well you know the other thing i think is that paul was not shy about teaching about uh prophecy and we shouldn't be shy about it either. My dad liked to talk to me about it when I was a kid. And I was always fascinated. And I really thought Jesus was coming back in the 70s and in the 80s. And and um, one of these times he's going to come back. <laughs> yeah. you know, I know a lot of Christians go, oh, well, you guys were talking about that in the 70s and he didn't come back. Well, that doesn't mean he's not going to. Yeah. At some point, he's going to come back. I'm sure the very first century, people, you know, they should have known that he was coming. The yeah. time period that if you look at what Daniel had to say, if you studied the scriptures, you would have known, hey, we're getting close. And they missed it. You know, most of them missed it. Yeah. yeah. But um, I think what Jesus said was when you see these things begin to happen, look up. Now, that doesn't mean we're supposed to just sit out in the backyard and look up in the sky all the time. But we should be, we should be aware of what's time period we're living in and we're living in a time period that i think was prophesied in the bible you know when you look at uh revelation chapter 13 i mean talking about people getting a mark you can't buy or sell without the mark mm. we have a computer system now that can track people yeah and we're not far from that you know in in china right now people have yes. their phones with them and they're being tracked and yeah. and people will the, the the authorities will pull them over and say where have you been and if they lie they know where they've been because yeah. their phone's tracking everywhere they go 
and they're getting punished for it. And to think that that could not happen here is naivete. I think that's naive to think that that couldn't possibly happen here. There are a lot of things happening that I didn't think were possible and that are happening. So um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the term normalcy bias. Mm -hmm. Normalcy bias is the uh, it's the bias that says, well, the sun came up and the sun goes down. And it's going to do the same thing tomorrow and everything's the same and no, nothing ever changes. And uh, that's what the, the Jewish shop owners believed in Germany before World War II. They said, well, mm. that's not going to happen here. And then they were wrong. The people before Katrina were warned two weeks before that there's a storm coming, it's going to flood the city. A lot of them left. A bunch of them didn't because they said, ah, we've got a wall up. Yeah. And they were wrong. You know, the prediction was right. They failed. Many people lost their lives. So the normalcy bias is that, you know, I've talked to even believers now saying, you know, we're getting close to Jesus coming. Oh, that could happen 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now. Yeah, it could. It also could happen. <laughs> yeah, it could, it could happen today. You know. Yeah. So I, th I just think I look at the signs and I think, you know, it's, it's never gotten this, it's never been this bad before. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes you wonder if the Lord delays for another hundred years, how bad would it be? Yeah. Jesus did yeah. say this: When I return, will I find any faith? Mm. And uh, so. I guess we got a ways to go, but yeah, that makes me concerned for my grandchildren. So I'll, you know, I'll die, and and the country that we've left them is a mess. It took us forty presidents to get to five trillion dollars in debt as a nation, mm -hmm. and today we're thirty trillion dollars in debt, thirty-one. Yeah. So uh, we doubled it during George Bush's time, mm -hmm. and Obama all nearly doubled it, went from ten to nineteen and a half. And then Trump didn't really slow the spending at all. And now no. when when Biden got into office, the first thing he did was spend six trillion dollars, stimulus, yeah. all this kind of stuff, and causing the inflation rate to go sky high. So the cost of everything goes way up. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're if you were trying to destroy a country, you couldn't do a better job than what he's doing think, right now. I think Glenn Beck says that a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, would, well, that's or, true. How would you do it? any different <laughs> i don't know what you would do this would this seems to be the way you would do it and yeah. uh it's it's sad i don't i don't like seeing it uh and you know you could sit and think about it all the time and worry about it and drive yourself crazy i don't do that i mean i have to think about it it's my job and i have yeah. to think of ways of drawing about it but um at, at the end of the day you have to think the lord's in control the lord already knew all this was going to happen and he says that he loves us, going to take care of us. So we'll mm. put our trust in him. Don't be stupid. Don't sit on your hands and do nothing. Get busy doing work and doing what we were talking about earlier, you know. Uh, share Christ with people as God gives you opportunities. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Gary, I, I have really enjoyed this conversation. I Thanks, have really Justin. enjoyed it. I don't want to keep you all night. I've got some little ones to lay down tonight as well. Good. And uh, well, I gotta I gotta tell your mom and dad when I see them that, that they did a good job with you. <laughs> <laughs> They'll appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I told him I was I was doing this. Uh, I think last week I was talking to him, but uh, okay. They uh they were excited about it. They they like good. what we're we're doing, and it's um, uh, you know, my dad he had the History Channel on a lot as a kid. And yeah. so I picked up on my love of history from him. And oh, good. so yeah. I, I, I see a lot of things happening. And, you know, I, I remember watching, you know, these documentaries and things about these men who just, when the challenge was there, they rose up and you right. see it all throughout history. And it just seems like we're at a point now where we need men to stand up. And we need men to stand up and you got it. You got to think of it this way too. This is an opportunity for you to be a man. Yeah. If you never had a problem, then nobody's going to know what you are. And we we would not revere an Abraham Lincoln if there hadn't been a civil war. Mm. Uh, you wouldn't have revered the founding fathers if they hadn't had to fight for this country. Okay. So we're in a battle, and it's a spiritual war, and we fight it differently than with weapons of you know. The weapons of the world we we fight it with prayer 
knowledge of the word of God and, uh, and the power of God, you know, so that, yeah, yeah, yeah you're exactly so. right. Um, Hey, I will leave all your links in the, in the description. Oh, so people will check that out and I hope people will go sign up and, uh, get your newsletters. I, I, I enjoy them. My, my son good. enjoys it. He, he loves drawing. He's, oh, he's like his grandpa. He loves drawing too. And, uh, and it, you know, it's fun for him. And, uh, you know, what's even more fun than drawing, getting paid to draw. That's the best. <laughs> I'll tell him that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I have a stack of books about that big where he, he'll just draw me a book, you know, and oh, I'll cool. take it to work with me. He just, that's, that's fun. just what he enjoys. Nice. And yeah. Yeah. But, um, I usually end with, I, I want to give you the opportunity to give the guys that listen a challenge. It can be something for this week, for the new year, whatever it may be. It, it's okay. all up to you. Give them okay. a challenge. All right. So, uh, I think today, in this culture today, people try to tell you to be free, that you find your freedom, and that's when uh, you'll really be who you're supposed to be. I'm going to tell you something different. It's something I heard from Warren Wearsby years ago. You want to be free? Find your master, then you'll be Mm. free. He said, when is a train really free to run at full speed? When it's in the middle of a field or when it's on the tracks? You and I were made for God, and we never will be free until we find our freedom in Him. Jesus said, come learn of, learn of me, and then you'll be free. And so if I think for this, the challenge to other men is that uh, get to know your Creator, get to know Jesus Christ, and then you'll know how to be a man. The more you know about Him, because He is the ultimate man, He is the superman. Yeah, that's perfect. That's great. Good. I I like that. Yeah, that'll be challenging. So, right. yeah, I I appreciate this, Gary. I really do. I think Thanks, guys Justin. are going to be encouraged to be Good. better men, and that's my goal. Good I to talk encourage to you. Them to do that. Yes, you too. God bless you. You too.